My name is uh, Doug Maynard. I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all to this presentation. Our, our title of today's presentation, as part of our ongoing series related to screening tools uh, in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, the title for today is a novel screening test for the behavioral phenotype of FASD. And we've got some great presenters today. Two of them, uh, actually all three of them, uh, you may be familiar with. One of them has been on a bit of a hiatus as far as our webinar series is, is concerned. But uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Gideon Corrin, uh, who's uh, well known to anyone who's participated in any of our uh, FASD screening tools uh, webinars. Uh, but Dr. Corrin is the founder and director of the Mother Risk Program and is a Professor of Pediatrics, Pharmacology, Pharmacy and Medicine, and, and a whole bunch of other things uh, at the Hospital for Sick Children. And he's got uh, his bios up on the Knowledge Exchange Network for, for anyone who wants to look at that. Um, but he's certainly a, 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 one of the leaders on our uh, FASD Screening Tool Steering Committee and certainly in the community of, of the, in the FASD community. We also have someone who uh, you may also re you may recall, Dr. Carmen Rasmussen, who's a developmental psych uh, psychologist and assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta and is a research affiliate at the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital in Edmonton. Carmen was with us uh, a number of weeks ago uh, doing a, a couple of webinars uh, with our rehab uh, community within CAFC, uh, Sensor Network, where we were talking about uh, interventions uh, that are making a difference in FASD. And again, that... Um, webinar was recorded and is up on our Knowledge Exchange Network for anyone who wants to see that. Um, and also with us today, we have, uh, you may recall, back a couple of years ago, I think Dr. Nash was with us. Dr. Kelly Nash is working as a psychologist in at McMaster Children's Hospital in the Child and Youth Mental Health Outpatient Program. And she uh, continues to do research into understanding the neurobehavioral phenotype of children with uh, FASD. So today, uh, as I mentioned, our title is a novel screening test for the uh, behavioral phenotype of FASD. And I think uh, without, uh, I think that covers all of the, the details for the session today. And it's my pleasure to pass the, the virtual uh, podium over to Dr. Gideon Corn. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all with us. Um, the area of screening for FASD is one of the foci identified by the Public Health Agency of Canada, their FASD team, and in collaboration with the CAFC, with the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers, uh, with uh, Elaine as, as the CEO, we started in 2007 to identify and then develop and implement methods which can help Canadian, American, and for that matter, all over the world, clinicians and workers, child workers, to try to identify kids by screening them so they can be followed by full diagnosis of FASD. With respect to the particular tool, and very exciting tool we are talking about today, this is the result of about 10 years of work, as you will hear from Kelly and Carmen. It all started uh, when uh, Professor Joan Rovet here at the University of Toronto thought that she's recognizing a specific pattern in children that were already diagnosed by us at the Mother's Program with FASD. To go one step back, for years, people who treat these kids, diagnose these kids, the parents, think that there is a specific phenotype. That these kids are different from kids with other developmental issues. But somehow this was never quantified. Everyone felt that there is something in the social, behavioral uh, areas. Um, terms like lack of conscience and cruelty, and, and, and adjectives of that nature appeared. Uh, Straska is, of course, the leader of the behavioral part of FASD, published in the late 90s a, a paper from Seattle where parents reported what's unique about their kids' behaviors. And there were trends coming out. The main issue there was this, there were no true control for kids with other developmental issues. So yes, these kids were very different in Straska's eye 
from normal healthy kids raising healthy families. But uh, I'll, I'll leave for Kelly to tell you how the story evolved in Toronto. But using a large clinic diagnosed, the diagnosed FASD in Toronto, we managed to synthesize and identify a pattern that may lead to an ability of a large community of workers to screen for FASD. And that's what we call the NST, Neurobehavioral Screening Test. Uh, Kelly Nash was a student at that time with us. Now she's a clinical psychologist uh, working in the field. And I will now pass the, the microphone to Kelly and the slides, of course. I do want to remind everyone, uh, during Kelly's uh, comments or any other time you have questions, you can type them for uh, Doug to feed it back to us so we can answer them. So without any further ado, uh, Kelly, why won't you describe to us the NST tool revised? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Corin. It's great to uh, be back <coughs> in the ring with everybody um, and great to see so many people registered for this from uh, across the country and, and others. So as Dr. Corin mentioned, I'm going to walk us through really today's goal is the practical utility of the NST. And for those of you who have been following us over the last 10 years, you'll notice that this is the revised version. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as, uh, as we go. I just want to acknowledge uh, my longstanding mentors on the project, Dr. Corin and Dr. Robet. And uh, here we go. So in terms of the overview for my talk today, I'll briefly touch on our rationale for our current method of screening, why we thought it would be a good idea in the first place to screen for FASD, as well as talk about the stages of screening tool development at SickKids, because I think this is a really important piece um, that we've spoken about before, how this toolkit is really an evolution, a work in progress, and we're constantly adapting it and changing it to provide the best possible clinical tool that we can. Then I'll present the NST and try to incorporate it into a case study so we can really together see a practical use of the tool today. So many of you um, are probably well aware, both clinically and based on the research, that many of the impairments in children on the FASD spectrum include challenges with attention, social cognition, and self-regulation. And when you put all three of these together, it really has a detrimental impact on a child or youth's ability to successfully navigate their social world. And so a lot of you might also know that, that these, this sort of trifecta of, of impairments isn't unique to the condition of FASD. Um, there are challenges that are faced by other um, diagnoses of childhood, such as ADHD and ODD. So as clinicians and diagnosticians, we're constantly faced with the challenge of when to screen, when to diagnose, and how do we rule in and rule out different diagnoses of childhood to try to develop the best possible treatments and treatment outcomes. So with that in mind, why screen for FASD? Our goal when this, with the inception of this project in 2005 was really that of, at that time, one of a Canadian perspective. We are a geographically diverse country, and many of our families live in remote and rural regions without ready access to diagnostic clinics, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, and developmental pediatricians. And it's often quite a long trek for many of these families to make their way into larger centers for an, a full FASD assessment. So our goal was that we could possibly use a behavioral screening tool as a first line process over the course of diagnosis to help better identify which children or youth are suitable for the whole multidisciplinary diagnostic batteries. In doing so, our goal was that we would be able to reach children and youth in a multitude of settings outside of just the hospital to include schools, groups, home, group homes, and, and the justice system, just to name a few. And our final goal was, given the considerable overlap in the behavioral profile of children with FASD from other developmental conditions, our hope was that we might be able to behaviorally distinguish 
FASD from some of these other conditions like ADHD or conduct or oppositional defiant disorder. Our further goal was that we wanted this screening questionnaire to be simple, easy to administer, applicable in a variety of contexts, as I mentioned, eventually and potentially have the ability to be culturally appropriate, sensitive and specific from an evidence-based perspective. And as I've sort of mentioned, um, it's really, the idea is that it's the first line in the diagnostic process. So I want you to keep these um, important points in mind as we walk through, uh, once we get to the tool. So as Dr. Korn mentioned, this has been a long journey at SickKids in terms of the screening tool development that actually began back in 2001 um, with Dr. Rachel Greenbaum, who is a student at the hospital at the time. And along with Drs. Korn and Rovette, they utilized the child behavior checklist, which was an already validated um, parent report questionnaire. And it's one that's actually readily used in many uh, diagnostic clinics across Canada. It includes 118 items with the goal of which being having the parent fill out the questionnaire and then putting all the items together to say how similar a child's profile is to other conditions of childhood, such as anxiety or ADHD. However, because of the overlap between FASD and other diagnostic conditions, we were really interested in the items. Could we be very specific um, in differentiating these profiles? So that's exactly what Dr. Greenbaum did in 2001. She took all 118 items and compared children with FASD from typically developing children. And she found that 12 of those items were very indicative of children with FASD. And those items were act young, no guilt after misbehaving, impulsivity, arguing, lying or cheating, inattentiveness, clowning around, hyperactivity, stealing inside the home and outside the home, cruelty, and disobedience. And I'd like to just take a minute to put a little bit of a disclaimer um, at this point. In over the years presenting on this tool, many clinicians and parents and caregivers have made the very astute observation that the language used in this questionnaire um, isn't perhaps as positive or framed in as positive a way as we could. And for the purposes of validation and sticking with an already validated questionnaire, for the time being, we need to stick closely to the language used in the CBCL. Our hope and our goal is that once we've validated this, we may be able to start tweaking with the language to make it a little bit more appropriate. So moving on, um, I came onto the scene as a graduate student in uh, 2006, and I wanted to build on Dr. Greenbaum's work with the team at SickKids. So we brought in a brand new sample of children um, use the same 12 items, and we wanted to see could we replicate Dr. Greenbaum's finding of distinguishing children with FASD from typically developing children, and furthermore, could we use these items to distinguish between a group of children with ADHD? And indeed, what we found was just that. Um, we found that 10 of the 12 items that Dr. Uh, Greenbaum found distinguished children with FASD from norm normal controls were highly indicative of FASD. And we also found of those 10, six were highly indicative of separating out children with FASD from children with ADHD. And those items were acting young, cruelty, lack of guilt after misbehaving, lying or cheating and stealing. And so this made me curious. I looked at those items and I thought, you know, the remaining items are highly reflective of a population of children with ODD. And so could we take this one step further and piece out, further differentiate the FASD profile from the ODD profile. And so in 2010, that's, that's just what we attempted to do. So using a third and different sample, <coughs> we were successful in differentiating children with FASD from typically developing children on those 10 items, as well as differentiating children with ADHD from children with FASD on those six items, and when we looked at FASD compared to ODD, we found that only one item, and that item was Axe Young, differentiated FASD from ODD. For those of you in the audience who have been following our screening tool development over the years, you'll notice that until, until today, we've included this, uh, this phase in our screening tool. However, as validation studies have progressed, which Dr. Asmussen will speak to, 
um, we've we run into a bit of a hiccup in that we can't actually calculate sensitivity and specificity using only one item. So as such, the tool that I'll be presenting today and that we're moving forward with in terms of our validation study does not include this latest phase of development for now. So we'll walk through um, our new and revised two-step tool for identifying potential FASD, with the first step really being to identify behavior suggestive of FASD. So this is really that first phase looking at our FASD compared to typically developing children um, comparison data. And then the second step is really teasing apart the FASD profile from an ADHD profile. And before we go any further, questions that I'm asked a lot from um, clinicians and sort of frontline workers, or who should use the tool? Um, can anybody use it? Can parents use it? And so, you know, just to be very clear about how our goal in terms of how the tool is being used, it's designed to be administered with caregivers. So note the emphasis on the with of children and youth suspected of having an FASD. And this is based on observable behavior. So unlike some of our other tools in the kit, this is really behavioral driven. Um, and it should be a caregiver who knows the child well enough to answer the, the 10 questions in the NST. And going back to the with, our goal is that this form should be administered um, by a qualified health and social service professional within the context of a clinical interview. And our rationale for this is given the, the language in the questionnaire, we wanted to try this to try to be as family and client centered as possible. So we really want to emphasize that this should be used within the context of an, a general and more broad based clinical interview. Another important point is the form should not be scored by the caregiver. It should be scored by the clinician. And it should be, it's important to note that the child, it's based on the child's behavior within the last six months. And this is in keeping with the parameters put forth by the CDCL. And this shouldn't take more than five minutes um, of the total clinical interview uh, to administer. So folks, let me know if, uh, if it does. So we, I wanna try and apply the NST now within the context of a case. So this is a fictional case um, but probably hits home for quite a lot of you working as clinicians in the field. So we're going to take a look at John, who's a 12-year-old grade 6 student in a special education behavior class. He was removed from his mother's care as an infant uh, at eight months of age because of her alcohol and drug abuse. He's had several foster care placement and currently resides in a group home. We know he learns best when there's structure and clear rules outlined in a nonverbal format. His teacher and workers describe him as running on a motor and being distracted by the slightest noise. After a distraction, he's got great difficulty reorienting to the task at hand. He has a previous diagnostic history of ADHD, ODD, and depression. He was recently arrested for stealing hockey cards and cigarettes from the corner store, and he denies this despite being caught on tape. His group home workers also report theft in hole at the group home, and they describe him as disobedient and as, a, as appearing to willfully pick on younger children. They express their frustration that despite trying several social skills interventions, he still does not show any remorse. And according to his worker, he may be 12, but he's functioning like an eight-year-old. So I'll just give you a couple more seconds to have a look at the vignette, and then we'll see how this applies to the actual screening checklist. So if we have a look, this is a, somewhat how the checklist appears on our, our CAPC website. And so what you would do after you know, you've administered your, your clinical interviews, you would pull out the checklist and simply check off uh, the numbers. So in John's case, he's been described as acting much younger than his age. So he's described as appearing more like an eight-year-old. His group home workers use the word disobedient to describe him. He was caught lying uh, after stealing from a corner store despite the video evidence. He's been described as showing no remorse. He's been described as highly distractible. <laughs> he isn't described as impulsive though, based on the vignette. And he's also described as running on a motor. He's described as picking on younger children in his group home. He's been described as stealing from the group home and stealing outside. 
So once you've got all of these tallied, you proceed to the box at the end of the screening tool form and simply fill it in accordingly so for all of your yeses. So you can use ticks or you could use numbers. I've used numbers in this presentation just to try to make it as clear as possible in this forum. And then you would proceed to the second page of the screening checklist. And the first box that you see, which reads at least six checks in column A, this box is reflective of our data comparing FASD children to typically developing children. Can we, is there an FASD suspected? And so we're looking for at least six checks in column A. So if we go back to John, we've got at least six checks in column A. So we would follow the arrow, yes. So what this suggests is that John's profile is reflective of a suspected FASD and he's got ADHD symptomatology. So we need to tease those two things apart. So we wanna look for <coughs> in column B. So if we go back and we look at John, he's got at least three checks in column B. So he would be a positive screen for FASD and we're calling this positive screen A, which suggests that we can separate FASD from typically developing children with a 14% false positive rate and an 18% false negative rate. And we can further differentiate children with FASD from children with ADHD with a 19% false positive rate and a 28% false negative rate. And the details behind the statistics of this is available in our 2006 paper. Um, now, for many, for the 25 to 30 percent of our kids on the FASD spectrum who don't have comorbid ADHD, we needed to do something about them too. So that's where, if you look to our first box, which has at least six checks in column A, if a child doesn't meet um, criteria for that, we move on and we look for at least three checks in column C. And so that was again based on our 2006 data that had additional statistical properties for those children who don't, who, whom we don't wanna miss if they don't also have an ADHD profile. And that constitutes our positive screen B with a 30% false positive and a 20% false negative rate. So moving on, for those of you who have been following the screening tool development, you've probably seen me present this slide at nauseum. Um, however, I do feel it's an important message to communicate and to get across because even as researchers and clinicians working on this project, we find ourselves having to remind ourselves of this from time to time. And that is that screening is not a diagnosis. Um, it is a public health service in which members of a defined population, in this case FASD, who do not necessarily perceive they are at risk of or are already affected by a disease or its complications, are asked a question or offered a test to identify those individuals who are more likely to be helped than harmed by further tests or treatment to reduce the risk of a disease or its complications. And the goal here is that what we know from the years of research on this condition and on this population is that early assessment and identification leads to early intervention, which leads to much improved long-term outcomes. And that's really the goal for this whole project, or one of them. So in terms of our next steps, we're currently validating the tool, the two-step tool in other clinics in Canada, and Dr. Rasmussen will speak to this momentarily. And we're also hoping to evaluate the reliability and validity of so really important core psychometric properties using a larger sample prospectively. And this is also something that Dr. Rasmussen is going to speak to. I'm happy to take questions. Um, at the end of this presentation, or if it, it's better to answer them all at the end, that's fine too. But before I turn it over to Dr. Rasmussen, I just want to acknowledge uh, my mentors and collaborators, Dr. Rachel Greenbaum, Dr. Paul Sandor, Dr. Judith Wiener, are many, many families and participants over the years. Um, and this research was uh, supported uh, by a graduate scholarship at the Provincial Center of Excellence at Chio. Thanks very much. All right, thank you, Kelly. Uh, we do have a few questions, and some of them are very specific to, to, the, to the tool itself that you just presented, so it's probably best if we take some of those now, and we'll see how many we get through, and perhaps we'll, we'll save some of them for the end before we pass over to uh, Dr. Rasmussen. Um, the first tool is simply, what age range is this tool targeted to? Six to 18-year-olds, which is the parameters uh, put forth by the CBCL. Okay. And uh, the next question was, uh, how do you assess uh, in quotes, acts young. Is this solely subjective 
uh, or is it based upon other parameters? It's a great question. The simple answer is that it's solely subjective. Um, so in ministering this clinically, we try to stick as close to the, the range of use as possible. So if you imagine a parent being handed the paper and pencil format of this, which is how the CBCL looks, the question on the CBCL is acts too young for his or her age. So it's subjective as possible. Um, from a clinical perspective, I might follow up on that for my own interest, but in terms of the hard line purposes of the tool, it's subjective. All right. Uh, the next question uh, from Heather is, uh, couldn't the stealing behavior be seen as impulsive in nature? I suppose it could. Um, and the, the stealing behaviors that we, we've come to see, you know, I, I think from my perspective in kids with FASD, is that a lot of it has to do with impulsivity um, and difficulty learning from past experiences. And again, just coming back to um, from a hard data item perspective, really looking at the sort of concrete nature of the item. So there might be, imp the impulsivity question might be endorsed and the stealing might be endorsed and vice versa. All right, now this next question, uh... Uh, we may uh, want to engage uh, Dr. Corin here, and, and we'll try to keep this answer short because if we get them started, we might be here all day. But the next <laughs> question is, uh, do you know of any site using meconium or hair screening for alcohol metabolites at birth to help establish alcohol exposure? Thank you for the question. It's not really our focus, but there are many, many such centers now. I'll be very happy to answer more specifically electronically. Uh, more to the focus of the of Kelly's presentation, just to remind everyone, in parallel to having centers like uh, Edmonton that you will hear from in a minute, it's another reason for this webinar. Part of our task is to create a community of clinicians who want to use the tool and communicate with us the tool. So if any of you uh, on this webinar is interested, kindly let us know and we will communicate with you. We have an increasing group of clinicians, of course, psychologists, social workers, and other uh, child workers across the country that are using it now. And of course, the success of any tool, even the best tool in the world, depends upon clinicians doing it and showing that it works for them. Doug and Giddy, it's Elaine Warbein. I just want to just strengthen that or add to that comment and that we really invite those of you on, on our webinar today to to connect with us uh, in the CASTI office. Um, A, to give us your thoughts and experiences if you are using one of our tools within the National Screening Toolkit. Um, the purpose of, of, of this request is really to help us um, improve, help us look at the utility of the tools in their current state and provide opportunities to think about enhancements as well. So, Kitty, thank you for, for raising that. And, and just to also add that there are, we do have a number of, uh, the, the meconium screening tool is part of the screening toolkit that's on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. We have a number of different uh, previous webinars that have all focused on meconium from uh, the test itself, from the evidence or supporting the test. Uh, we have a number of sessions about the ethics sur surrounding the whole issue of using meconium screening. So there's, there's lots of information on our site about the meconium screening test. But to get back to uh, the, uh, the current topic, the focus of the, of the current presentation, we'll just take two, maybe two more questions and we'll save the rest uh, for the end because there, there are quite a few here. Um, the next question is, how does the study account for the effect of medication on the children's behavior? Many of our prenatally exposed kids don't exhibit some of these behaviors when on medication, but do exhibit when off their med medication. That's a fantastic question um, and something that we didn't control for um, over the years in our studies and, and perhaps something that we definitely need to take into account moving forward with our prospective studies um, in terms of having parents fill out the questionnaire thinking about their child on versus off of medication. It's a great question. But again, uh, to add to this, for the sake of this screener, if this Caretakers, parents typically, know that the kid have pro 
problem A, B, or C while not on medication, then it should be screen positive because clearly he has the symptom. All right, so I actually, I guess we'll save the rest of the questions for later. One of the, one of the next questions is about the ADHD versus the FASD slide that you had uh, hi, uh, highlighted in your presentation, um, uh, Kelly. If you could just, uh, they were just asking if they could see it one more one more time. And uh, after we show that real quick, we'll we'll be handing over to uh, to Carmen to uh, go on. And, we'll, and we do have a number of other questions that we'll come back to. This, at the end. Wait, uh, this one. Uh, that's probably it. Okay. So we'll let her take a quick look at that. And uh, and again, we will have. Uh, I assume our presenters will be able to give us these presentations, which we will convert into PDF. And along with the actual recorded video, we'll be posting on the. If knowledge I can uh, use a very pediatrician <coughs> translation of this, kids with uh, ADHD who do not have alcohol effects don't have these sociopathic social behaviors. Yeah. Kids with FD, when I see in clinic a kid with ADHD, he's not typically cruel and he does have a guilt and so on and so forth. So these trends are typical of FASD and not in a typical ADHD. All right, so I'm going to uh, hand the virtual uh, podium over to uh, Dr. Carmen Rasmussen to uh, continue on with, the, uh, with her portion of the presentation. Thank you, um, Gideon and Kelly. Um, I will continue on here and talk about some of the research that we've done um, through the University of Alberta um, using the NST. I just want to acknowledge some of the co-investigators and people that have been involved in the two studies that I'm going to talk about. Um, so Kelly's already described the NST. Um, we use the current version, which has the, the 10 questions that from the CBCL that have been found to be predictive of FASD. And so we use this in our research. And what we wanted to do <clears throat> is we administer the NST um, to caregivers and we wanted to be able to differentiate, um, if we could differentiate those children who were diagnosed with an FASD um, at um, two clinics, as well as children with confirmed pediatrical exposure, but who did not have a formal FASD diagnosis. So uh, most of the children in this group were from this is through the Glen Rose Hospital, um, their, their FASD clinic that we work with. And um, children seen in the clinic are all exposed to alcohol, but not all children will meet all of the criteria for FASD and to get a diagnosis. Um, so we have a group of children that do have alcohol exposure, but don't have all of the criteria for FASD. So we also wanted to look at how these children would rate on the NST as well. And then, of course, we had typically developing controls that had no app alcohol exposure at all and that was based on maternal screening in a questionnaire that we did. So we started with a study at the Glen Rose Hospital in Edmonton and um, we administered the NST to participants, this is after they were seen in the clinic, years after, um, who were you know coming in for another study as well. And then we also added a second site in Vancouver um, through the National NeuroDevNet project um, in order to increase our sample sizes and to have two sites. So in the end, we've ended up with um, 48 children with FASD, 40 with prenatal alcohol exposure, and I'll refer to those as the PAE group um, throughout, and then 32 controls. Um, so they don't differ on gender, they don't differ on mean age, it was all around age 12, and they all range from about 6 to 17. Um, the groups do differ on current living arrangements, um, which is to be expected. Um, more children in the FASD and PAE groups were not living with their biological parents or were in foster care and they also differed in mean number of living situations and then we do have a somewhat um, a slight uh, a difference in SES as well between the control and the PE and the FASD group um, so we're looking at controlling for SES in some of our analyses um, because we weren't able to completely match for it so our results, these are our results here, and they show um, this is the overall screening positive on the test. So the FASD group, 63% uh, about screen positive and about 37.5 screens negative. Um, the PAE group, we see just over half screening positive and um, just under half screening negative. And importantly, the control group, absolutely none screened positive and all screened negative. So what this shows is that the sensitivity of the NST was 62% because it was able to identify, correctly identify 62% of the children who had actually already been diagnosed with FASD. 
but the specificity was 100% in that none of the controls screened positive, which is quite important. Um, when we actually look at the individual questions, um, these are the 10 questions and we can, these are the endorsement rates here for the FASD, PAE and control group. And you can see quite high endorsement rates on most of the questions for FASD and PAE and quite very low on the, um, for the control group. So this is actually the percentage of um, caregivers who, who responded yes to these questions. So the FASD is significantly different than the controls on every single question in terms of higher endorsement rates. I'm not sure if you guys can see this third column here, um, but it's not showing up quite on mine, but the PAE were also significantly different from controls on all except for one item. And then, although it would approach significance, but then importantly, again, the FASD and the PAE group actually did not differ significantly in the endorsement rates on any of the questions. Although, as you can see, the FASD did tend to have higher, um, um, higher percentage of yes to these questions in the PAE group. Another thing to notice is these last three questions, actually, um, ones that could potentially be seen as more negative, I guess, um, the cruelty, the stealing. Um, we actually had much lower endorsement rates for both of those in the FASD and the control group. So less than half of the population um, reported, um, answered yes to those questions. So it wasn't the majority of the children. It was, um, you know, it still was a, a higher proportion, you know, 47 or 40 percent and whatnot, but it was, um, you know, less than half of, of the, the sample. So we did see lower endorsement rates on those questions. So this first study, um, which we're, we're preparing right now for publication, um, our findings are similar to previous reports um, with good sensitivity and excellent specificity. Um, another thing to note is that um, over half of the children with PAE did screen positive, and it's very likely that these children with PAE, I mean, they are exposed to alcohol, just at the time of assessment, they did not meet all of the criteria for the FASD diagnosis, but it is likely that some of them are indeed on the FASD spectrum, and if they're reassessed later in the future, may actually get an FASD diagnosis. There's various reasons why children seen at the Glen Rose Clinic um, may not get an FASD diagnosis um, if they have alcohol exposure, if they don't show enough significant impairments, perhaps they're too young and it's difficult to measure areas of executive functioning and whatnot, or have, perhaps there's a lot of other environmental instability going on at the time and they can't necessarily rule that out as potentially being a factor. So. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing that we see um, um, the positive screens in the PAE group because many likely are on the FASD spectrum. Um, it also begs the question about um, what about sensitivity against other neurodevelopmental populations, which we didn't look at in this study. So in our next study, um, we, based on the findings of our first study, we applied for a grant um, to the Canadian Foundation for Fetal Alcohol Research, which we received a funding for. And here what we're doing is we're actually looking at the NST um, in the screening of FASD, um, because that's what the tool is designed for. So in our previous study, and I believe in other studies done on it, it was administered to FASD samples after diagnosis. So after we know that they have FASD, then it was administered to them. So what we're doing now is we're actually giving them the questionnaire before they are seen in the clinic. So at a true, um, you know, before the parent is aware that the child has a diagnosis of FASD as well, and before the clinicians even know. So parents are filling out the questionnaires um, with the pre-screening or with the, the pre-questionnaire package before they're seen in the clinic. So, so we are administering it or offering it to all children that are referred to the Glen Rose Hospital for FASD. And um, we also are administering it in a separate clinic, a separate neurodevelopmental clinic that sees children with other neurodevelopmental dis um, difficulties other than FASD, such as um, ADHD, learning difficulties, autism. And we are administering it there as well, screening prior to them being seen in the clinic to see how well it differentiates that group. And then we're also going to examine whether the actual um, data on NSD, whether it actually correlates with the results of the neurobehavioral testing used to, to, to actually um, give the FASD diagnosis. So um, the results of the NST will not be used during the diagnosis and the clinicians when they're diagnosing FASD do not know what they're, if they scored positive or negative on the, on the NST. And then after the fact, we will look at whether or not 
performance on that correlates with the actual objective cognitive testing. So what we have here is we have four groups that we're, we are actively right now um, collecting this data. We hope to get 40 per group, um, ages six to 16. And so the first group is really all of the children that are referred for FASD to the Glen Rose Hospital, who then will be divided into our FASD diagnosed group or who receive an F a diagnosis on the FASD spectrum because FASD is not a clinical diagnosis, as well as the PAE group who have alpha exposure and no diagnosis. So they will be um, completing the questionnaire at the referral stage and then um, after the diagnosis, we will divide them into the groups based on the diagnostic findings. And then we have our clinical control group, which is um, children that are seen in a separate neurodevelopmental clinic. Um, again, um, children with a variety of other difficulties, um, learning difficulties, autism are seen here. And then we are just also administering it to non-exposed control children from the community. So we don't have any data on this yet, but hopefully we will by fall because um, we're, we're collecting it right now. Um, and like I mentioned, we will be looking at how the NST correlates with the actual diagnostic data from the FASD assessments, which will be, re which will be really important, I think. But um, some of the significance here is this will be the first research, I think, to, to really look at the NST and the screening of FASD before children are being assessed. And we know that accurate screening is, is very important given that an earlier assessment or diagnosis of FASD is associated with better outcomes. So getting the children in earlier is important. Um, it'll also provide novel information on how the screening tool correlates with objective um, FASD cognitive tests. And then it will provide more evidence for the specificity against other neurodevelopmental populations. So I just wanted to thank everybody and the various funders for this project, and um, I guess we'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we did have a couple more questions come in specific to uh, to the to the second half of the presentation for Dr. Rasmussen. So the first one uh, for, uh, for you, Carmen, is how. And this slide, uh, this question came in just after the slide that you had with the table with the sort of the statistical analysis of the various components. Which, by the way, we could see that that right hand column. We could all see it clearly. Um, but this question was talking about a slide that had symptoms, and she. She's asking, how do these symptoms relate to early adversity, multiple moves, and attachment? Um, that is a great question. We haven't looked at that. Um, I don't believe we've looked at that in terms of the placements, but we could potentially um, look at whether or not these environmental indicators are correlating with um, with the NST results. And I know that's something that we can definitely look at in our prospective study. And we could actually look at that potentially in, in the um, study with the data already. So that's a great suggestion. I don't believe that we have looked at that, but I'll have to check um, because um, um, a student of mine has been leading and, and working on the data analysis. So I'll have to see what we've done there, but that's a really good question and, and, and a suggestion. All right. Um, so we'll go back to, the, to, to some of the earlier questions uh, that came in, and, and you know, again, bo both of, all of our presenters can feel free to uh, to jump in on any of these questions. Um, the the next question is: Given social development in the years before two, is there any plan to develop a tool for pr uh, preschool aged children? That's an excellent, excellent question, and one that has been on our minds for quite a long time. Um, I'm, I'm I'm assuming that the the listener asking this question is aware of the one and a half to five year old CBCL um, that can be administered to parents. Um, and we've just had been having difficulty getting enough numbers to make this uh, worthwhile in terms from a research perspective at this point. So if anybody out there um, is interested in collaborating or sharing some of this, we would be most interested. Well, in mother is. Uh... First, it's an amazing question, and actually, our mandate for the years 2012 and 14 include to bring the test down to age four. And at uh, Mother Esket Sikits, we have about 50 to 60 kids who were diagnosed uh, fully at the age of maybe diagnosed a little bit later, but we have the CBCL done at that age. So this is clearly, as Kelly said, uh, the one of the next targets. And uh, 
it, it will be more difficult because, of course, different domains may not be fully developed and a kid may not yet show all attention and, 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 and problems of that issues. So, uh, but this is clearly something that any of you interested or have data that can be shared, will be very happy to do that. Uh, the next question is, do you have any evidence of this tool embedded in a standard uh, fostering service, a standard fostering service to screen everyone who uses the, the care system, for example, the foster care system? Yeah, again, uh, presently, uh, our own clinic, and uh, I'll leave a comment to talk about Edmonton, does have a, a relatively large component of fostering. We did not analyze it with that in mind yet. And as to answer another question that we're talking about attachment and so on, we are now uh, doing uh, another analysis. We do have in Toronto mother risk, very large group of women who are depressed clinically that we follow up and do the CBCL. So we also look at the specificity when mom is depressed, but clearly we have not yet divvied out uh, the fostering situation as such, but many of our clinic cases are coming from fostering environment. And Carmen, did you want to comment on what's happening out uh, west in Edmonton? If it's and Vancouver, being, actually. It's, sorry, if it's being used in um, in the foster care system? Yeah. No, are some of your kids from a fostering context? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, as you saw, the majority were not living in their biological homes. So, I, about half of the children are in foster care. And yeah. so, it was the, the current caregiver that had completed the, the form. So, we, we do have a number of the children in our research that are currently in foster care. Yes. Um, the next question, and there's an acronym here, I'm not sure uh, we're all going to understand, so uh, if the person ask, asking the question, Aiden uh, is the name, um, you may have to type in a follow-up question to clarify, but uh, the question is, working in Ireland as a social worker with children in care, and the vignette uh, that you gave sums up uh, two of the case, two of his cases, but CAMHS service avoids focusing on FASD. What scales can I inform them of? I'm, I guess I, I can speak first here. I'm not quite sure I under, understand what's the um, reference um, is the question pertaining to just general um, behavior checklists or cognitive measures or specifically um, the screening tool itself that we presented. If we could get some clarification, that would be helpful for me. I'm not sure about you, Getty or Carmen. I may uh, risk here in kind of trying to guess it sounds that uh, in that domain area in uh, Ireland, uh, FASD is not yet acknowledged by the system. Uh, uh, of course, uh, this is a lot of uh, advocacy we need to do, but I guess it will be clever to go to the authorities with tools that were epidemiologically validated, like this one, to show that a relatively simple tool can help identify kids who may be at high risk of FASD. So they should be tested first. And of course, needless to say that apart from doing this short chat list out of the CBCL Akenbach test, it increased tremendously the insight of the team about those domains, things to look for, uh, areas that kids with FASD may be more affected with. But maybe if we get more clarification of, of the question, we can answer better. All right. Well, Aiden, if that answers your question, then great. If not, uh, feel free to, po uh, to, to type a follow-up that maybe we can better understand that, you know, specifically what types of scales and how that, that might help you out. But, um, the next question is, uh, considering early intervention equals improved outcomes, is there a similar tool used for children under six years of age? And we sort of talked a little bit about what's happening in children under six and where we're going with this tool and trying to validate it for those uh, as early as four years old. But what's happening below that? 
Yeah, well, this tool, of course, is not yet used at a younger age because it cannot be administered at a younger age. And of course, there is frustration here, but I want to remind uh, all of us that most clinics, including ours, does not diagnose a lot of, do not diagnose a lot of FASD before the age of five to six. A lot of them get the diagnosis of deferred to be seen again, because not all domains and all tests could be covered. And uh, so, so there is a frustration here. We want to intervene as early as possible. And of course, many interventions uh, are dependent upon the symptoms and signs and the areas, domains that need improvement and are not specific for FASD. But this tension about having tests earlier is clearly there. This particular tool has not yet been extended before the age of six. I think I would add to that too, Giddy, that under the age of six, what we know about a lot of our um, neuro and psychological assessment battery is that the test that we would give to assess the cognitive profile of a child with FASD, they're not, they're not as good as we would like them to be when we give them to kids under six, whether it's an FASD or ADHD or a, or a developmental disability. Um, so it's really hard as clinicians for us to even say with quite certainty, unless we're talking about a very severe delay, um, that we have any very good predictive validity of future um, the potential that a child might meet criteria for diagnosis down the road. Um, so, you know, looking below, I think we're, we're going to have to be very cautious in how we approach screening with, with this population. I totally agree. All right. Well, we did, we did get a, we did uh, get a follow up from Aiden about, uh, the gentleman from Ireland. Um, he said, many thanks. Uh, the, the child and adolescent mental health service tends to focus on ADHD or OCD diagnosis. And where I have gotten a clear pre-birth history of alcohol and substance misuse and a pediatric report questioning, questioning this option, this service avoids looking at FASD. The presentations have been great to open up a different diagnosis around the issue of FASD diagnosis in a child with complex difficulties. So. I would just uh, encourage our colleagues from Ireland. I'm sure in Ireland, similar to Canada, at least 1% of kids, when you look carefully, qualify to a FASD at, at the spectrum somewhere. So we do need all of us to go to our authorities, health authorities and other, to tell them that to ignore FASD is to disregard the obvious. It's not to see the major reason in Western world for sure for for developmental disability. And 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 this issue happened in other jurisdictions too. But this must be uh, done by us with very strong advocacy. All right. Uh, uh, Heather is asking um, how they can uh, uh, connect further with our group, uh, and we'll put some connect uh, some contact information up at the end. She, she's saying her her office screens all children entering foster care for the state of Delaware, and uh, she thinks this screening tool would be very valuable. So we'll we'll certainly put up some contact information up at the end of the screen. Uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, yeah. In no time, we'll create a connection and uh, share with you both our protocol and what we want to achieve and. To have uh, people from the U.S. will be amazing yeah. for obvious reasons. And D Doug, it, it, and Giddy, it's Elaine, I think just to add to that, what a fabulous uh, question and comment. And I thank you for that as well. And through our webinar and, and uh, the wonderful technology, where we can continue to communicate uh, between us and uh, so for new information as it comes along and just exploring new collaborative opportunities, um, you know, we can certainly keep that dialogue going. So uh, thank you for, for that comment. Uh, the next question is uh, from someone who has a client who is seeing a geneticist for an FASD assessment. 
And she's asking, would a completed NST be helpful for the family to bring with them to the appointment? And she's just clarifying that the child has not seen the doctor yet. The, the appointment is coming up in May. I may dare to start as a, clin as a pediatrician. There are some geneticists who are very familiar with the diagnosis of FASD. Other are more familiar with the physical part of it, the facial and so on, but maybe less than that with the neurobehavioral part. Of course, the Canadian guidelines for FASD include very clear assessment of neurobehavioral mm -hmm. domains. We generally, the need for two standard deviation below normal. I would suggest that uh, one way to make this screening valuable for the geneticist is maybe to connect him to us and uh, or the client and uh, and of course the, 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 the colleague who asked the questions so we can ensure that this doesn't go astray but rather that it's in a context all right uh, this next question, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure I understand it. Uh, Carmen, you might, uh, this might make sense to you, but she, she's asking one and a half to five CBCL. She's not aware of, of this and she's wondering what that is. Oh, I think Kelly commented on that. I think that's the age range. Kelly? Yep, that's right. So the, the CBCL has two age ranges for it currently, a six to 18. And then it's also got a younger version for one and a half to five year olds. And so in, a, in the, the development of the NST, we only use the, six the 18 year old version and not the one and a half to five year old version. Ages and ages ago, um, there was a four to 18 year old version of the CBCL, but it's not the most current version in use. If that helps to clarify. All right. Well, that helps me too. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, sorry. Okay, we'll just go on to the next question here. Uh, we would, uh, uh, Heather's saying we would love to, uh, uh, we would love to consider using the, the screening tool as part of their process for children entering foster care in Delaware. Um, could you talk more about recommendations following the NST screening and best practices for FASD intervention? And, and before we go on, as I mentioned at the top, uh, Car uh, Carmen uh, pr uh, was one of the uh, presenters on a, on a webinar that you can see on the Knowledge Exchange Network. The Knowledge Exchange Network, by the way, is what's on the screen in front of you now. So you can see the URL is ken.cafc.org. And if you just search in the top left there for FASD and interventions, uh, that presentation will come up and that'll give you a fairly high level overview of some of the more recent research. But Carmen, if you wanted to maybe take uh, start with this question about you know, what do they do after an NS, a positive NST and, and what, are, what types of interventions might be, just in, you know, in, a, in a summary. I think it is important to slide that Kelly finished with. NST is a screener, is not a diagnosis. So it's very important to say that NST per se cannot lead to action. The only action is diagnosis, namely to send the kid for diagnosis because he or she feel the criteria of the screener. Of course, diagnosis would lead to action based on the findings, the finding by the psychologist and by the team. But it's very important to make it clear that the NST does not lead by itself to action because we are very afraid to ensure that the NST does not replace diagnosis, but rather lead to diagnostic effort. All right. That is probably the best. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, Doug, if, if you want, and Carmen, feel free to add to this. Um, this is maybe a bit of a shameless plug here, but my doctoral thesis actually evaluated an intervention for children with FASD um, that you might be of interest in and has been validated in, in other populations. And it's a program that actually focuses on self-regulation, which was probably something that uh, Carmen spoke about uh, in the webinar. Uh, it's called the ALERT program. And it's a program I know that uh, Giddy is aware of as well. 
so I'd be happy to, to talk more about this online or over the email. Uh, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add, Carmen, from an intervention perspective. We still have Carmen. Carmen, are you? Yeah, still sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, th there are. Yeah, can you hear me out? Can you yes. Hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah, there are um, a lot of great interventions out there for children with FASD and some developed for young children with FASD. A lot of them are in research phases, though, right? They're, that um, we're testing the efficacy of them. So um, a lot of them are still being trialed and, and we are demonstrating the success of them. So, yes. Uh, the next question is, have you thought of comparing CBCL with FAS computerized photo programs? The, uh, uh, the FSD, the face part, of course, uh, is very important in pathognomonic when it's positive. Uh, and should be done as part of the diagnostic process. This particular one, of course, need to correlate as Carmen did and, and as, uh, as was done by uh, Kelly with the diagnosis. But do remember, please, that out of the four subtypes of FASD, the ones that have full facial pheno phenotype are very, very small. Very few kids have the full-blown face or the partial one, namely philtrum and upper lip. Most kids are in the, of course, falling into those who have neurobehavioral issues without facial. The exercise is still good to see. And I think studies show that kids with a full-blown syndrome are more likely to have a more full um, effect on neuro behavior too. And that's a very good idea for future. But at present, mo most kids seen by Carmen and by Kelly don't have facial. Some do, but the majority do not. So such a correlation may be more problematic. Right. Yeah, that's true. The majority of the children in our sample do not have the physical facial features of yeah, the air and D. The vast, vast majority, very few do have them, yeah. Yeah. All right, the next question is, uh, professionals and programs in the area of infant mental health would, ha would uh, sorry here, would, uh, would provide a good resource for data and collaboration. We have a strong resource, a strong group in Michigan, in Michigan uh, the Michigan Association of Infant Mental Health Community mental, uh, community mental health programs often provide uh, IMH services. So, yeah. Well, Michigan is, of course, uh, one of the leading jurisdictions in, in, in the United States. Uh, a lot of research and a lot of practice. Uh, we do collaborate with quite a few at the University of Michigan. And the Detroit group is amazing. Uh, yeah, the issue, of course, is we do look for clinics that use the CBCL as part of the diagnosis. Not everyone does, because there are other alternatives. Um, but, but certainly, this is a fabulous idea to follow. Um, so the next question, uh, I think we've more or less already answered. It was about interventions. Uh, what interventions do you institute once you've made a diagnosis of FASD in a child over the age of three to five? So I don't think we really need to go too much more into that unless anyone else wants to add anything more about interventions. Yeah, all, all to say that uh, Kelly's paper on the alert is kind of in stage of submission. So hopefully the information will be out there sometime. And there are some uh, follow-ups for that paper too. Um, the next question is from uh, one of our uh, colleagues in the UK, and she's just asking uh, if anyone on the panel knows of any practitioners uh, using or researching uh, this tool in the UK. No, the answer is no. I do not know if anyone will be delighted if anyone is interested. The tool is totally universal and uh, and we make it available without any any hurdles. Uh, so so if, if our colleagues in the UK are interested in one or in another form, 
would be more than happy to 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 send it their way to even meet and uh, have a uh, in training as we do here in Canada. All right. Uh, and we also had another follow-up comment from our colleague in Ireland who's uh, is asking, would the, De would the Delaware social workers be interested in linking with the Irish social workers around screening children in foster care? Uh, they'd be interested to see their protocols and how they would fit into the uh, to Ireland or offer Irish social workers working with children in care a model to work with. So certainly uh, if anyone wants to connect uh, with uh, you know the Delaware folks, with the Irish folks or anyone else, uh, don't hesitate to contact us. I, uh, I did put our uh, the contact information from the CAFC website. Website. You can always go to CAFC.org, that's C-A-P-H-C.org, and there's uh, uh, contact information on our from our website that uh, should be coming up on the screen in a second. Um, so you can always contact Elaine or I or just the general information. We'll connect you with our steering committee or any of the experts on the panel or what have you, as, as, as uh, whatever, whatever it takes to... Uh, to get you the information you're looking for. The next question we have is, uh, have you evaluated uh, use of the Akenbach teacher report form with related test items as a screening tool for children with unconfirmed prenatal history? The short answer is, is no, uh, not from a screening perspective. Um, but there are quite a few studies out there that have looked just in terms of examining more broadly the behavioral profiles of children with FASD. They've used the teacher form um, as, a, as an additional measure. Just uh, more methodologically, there is a trick here. Unconfirmed alcohol exposure, it's fair to say that most clinics will be quite resistant to make a diagnosis unless the kid have full-blown pathognomonic diagnosis or partial. But because the vast majority of kids are ARND, uh, most clinics, I, I think it's fair for me to say so, I participate in many of those organizations, the clinicians will be very reluctant to do it because of the overlap. We may get, of course, as years go by and we prove more and more the specificity and sensitivity of this tool or of the behavioral phenotype, hopefully with more couple of more hundreds of thousands of or thousands of patients, we may be able to frame the specificity of this tool or of the syndrome of the phenotype to go back, okay, despite the fact that I don't know if mom drank. This is highly specific for this, but we are not yet there. All right. Well, we have one more question here. We did have a comment come in from uh, Heather, who I'm assuming is from Delaware. She says yes to Ireland. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll send off an email so that you two can connect, and we hope that you will, uh, you'll keep us informed of any, any of your progress or, or connect with us if you need any support in, uh, in implementing these uh, screening tools or anything else around this issue. Um, the next, the last, what appears to be the last question at this point, we are a little bit over time, so we may, uh, we may be able to take one or two more questions if they come in, uh, quickly, but the last question that we currently have on the, uh, slate, uh, is asking, has anyone noticed an association of sinus bradycardia with FASD? Bradycardia has been associated with conduct disorder, but I wonder whether this is really FASD. Yeah, I, I, uh, did not check specific for this, but I must say that, this has not come in as an association. We have to be careful. Not everything that did not come, it may reflect that people did not look. Um, I must say that intuitively, because these kids are at very high levels of stress, with everything that goes with stress and hyperactivity, as a pediatrician now, I would be very surprised if they are bradycardic. But that's without looking at it specifically. It's worth looking, yeah. All right. Uh, and outside of a, a couple other offers to connect with uh, the folks in Ireland uh, and uh, Delaware, I think that, oh, we had one last question came in. So I think this will be the last question. Uh, do you think that for diagnosing children in a highly, in a high risk population for full blown FASD, a maternal interview, neurovelo neurodevelopmental tests, and weight? children taking head measures, basic measures, is, is that not sufficient to, uh, I think they're making, I think they're suggesting is that not sufficient for making the diagnosis? 
Of course it is. Except that the fact that mom drank or have high risk behaviors, and even if the kid is microcephalic, that does not make him a syndrome. You need to do a variety of neurobehavioral tests, and he or she need to to be in three domains within that range. So it will take uh, it will take, I would say, more than what you described to make a diagnosis. Uh, but clearly, what you ask, what you said, is is very essential. All right. Well, I think that is the, uh, the, the end of the questions. So uh, are, are there any last uh, closing comments from our panel? Any final words before we sign off? Again, I want to invite all of you to communicate with us. If you're interested to use the tool to communicate how it works and be part of our research group, uh, including the publications and so on. So just be in touch and uh, we'll be very happy to add you. <coughs> Kelly or Carmen, any last words? No, just thank you for, for the involvement. It's, it's been great. And um, I, I look forward to coming back and presenting some results from our perspective study in, in uh, about six to eight months. All right. Thank you as well for me, for everyone's excellent questions and, and enthusiasm for the, the project. It's great to be back and involved. All right. Well, thank you to all of our presenters. And one last question did come in about who to communicate with if they do have questions. And since uh, a lot of people do have my email address, uh, I'm Doug Maynard. Uh, you, a lot of you do have email addresses for me related to the webinar. You can always email me and I'll certainly be happy to forward it on to the most appropriate uh, person. So don't hesitate to contact me or go to our website and you can see uh, the contact information there. Uh, I don't. I think I forgot to mention off the top of the webinar, but we do record this webinar. Uh, so if uh, you missed any part or you want to share this with your colleagues, it will be posted on the page in front of you on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, you can always go to ken.cafc.org and search for FASD or NST or any of those sorts of uh, uh, search terms, and you should be able to find this webinar fairly easily. Uh, so don't hesitate to share the link with uh, whoever you think would be interested and, and also look at any of the other work that's up there. As we mentioned, we have uh, information and presentations on the meconium screening tool, uh, on the tool for youth probation officers and many other tools and other information about uh, screening, uh, information in general about screening and about FASD in general. So thanks again to our presenters. Uh, once again, a fantastic presentation and thank you to uh, everyone in the audience who showed up. And again, as Kelly said, for all the great questions and the great discussion. So. We hope to see everyone on our next webinar, and uh, you can always go to the CAFC website at the CAFC Presents section for a, a calendar of upcoming events, uh, and you can also subscribe to our uh, email notifications to uh, be informed of when uh, new webinars are being posted.